I grew up in the city of Newark. I was born in East Orange, New Jersey, and then we moved to um, Newark, and I lived there most of my life. I went to high school at Columbia High School in South Orange, and after high school I went to college. But when I was in the city of Newark, it was a very uh, difficult time during the 60s, uh, especially mid-60s, and there's a lot of turmoil between races and families, and it was a difficult time, but I had love in the family, and I had friends, and so we made it, we made it work. And then we moved to South Orange and then continued to do well uh, in school and as an athlete. But growing up in Newark was, uh, was really great. We had Weekway Park, we had a one family home. I had, uh, you know, run up and down Bourbon Street, Clinton Avenue, went to the Boys and Girls Club, went to the Newark Y. That's how I learned how to swim. We'd go to the museum, the, uh, we uh, would go to the um, planetarium that was here. So we had a really good childhood. And I say we because I had a brother as well. At that time, I have a sister too, but she came 16 years later. So during my younger period, it was just my brother and I, and it was a really nice place to grow up. Even though there was some, you know, problems going on, my family was really uh, spiritually based and well connected, and so they taught us to love each other, to be respectful, and I had friends here too. So this was my home. I was born in '62, and so we moved out after the riots. So in '69. I uh, went to South Orange and then uh, was with my father and my mother. They were separated and got divorced. And then we just had a great childhood. I had a house in Newark, a big house in the Wigwag section, a big house in South Orange. We would go back and forth. And I met people from different diverse backgrounds and I learned how to deal with everybody. And the foundation I learned in Newark uh, helped me when I got to South Orange. And, and then when I would come back to the city of Newark, you know, I was able to see and learn and, and figure out what was really going on between. Uh, the cultures and races and things like that. Well, I look at my life and everyone goes through adversities and the question was what adversities have I gone through? And as you're going through them, uh, I, I don't know if I looked at them as adversities. I would probably say challenges. Um, and the reason I say challenges is uh, because my parents raised us in a way that, you know, you don't make excuses, you work through situations, you don't blame people for your shortcomings or whatever is going on in your life. So it was a challenge. So I think at different stages in my life, I had different challenges. As a youngster, um, I was challenged because of where I lived. And then the challenge came because of where I was moved to. And then as an athlete, I was challenged because I was black. And in my event, there were not many black Americans running middle distance or distance runs. Uh, also, not being in commercials and having athletes that were nowhere nearly as good as me, uh, getting the commercials uh, and advertising and contracts that I should have gotten. But I didn't get them when I was younger, but as I got older, I ran faster, got bigger contracts. So everything is, comes in time. So I think, if, if to answer your question more directly, if I had to think of a challenge or as something at first that I had to overcome, would probably be just realizing that my God-given talent and trying to put everything together to maximize my skill sets in the, in the classroom and also athletically. Because when you're out there with people and you're trying to go and be the best you can be, that's a challenge. But you have to believe that you can aspire to great things. So my challenge was to realize that I had this talent and that I need to make sure that I do whatever I can to make sure that I accomplish the goals that I've set for myself. Jordan Clark Davis is someone that's honest, that has integrity, that's caring, that uh, has character. And when it's all said and done, I try and do the right things for the right reasons. And I think in life, as a, as a woman, uh, as a child, as an, as an adult, as a businesswoman, as a wife and as a mother, you do the right things for the right reasons. And if I, you know, could say it no other way but to say that I'm a person with integrity, with character, uh, night sound morals and I like to help people and I believe to whom much is given much is required so the more I have the more I try and do to people for people and with people to make them better and the better they become the better that makes me feel as well I think I was born with it uh, you know in my family you know some dogs just don't hunt so I was a hunting dog, so you don't have to, it wasn't something that was taught, it was something that was imbued in my spirit. And I think that uh, my parents, they nurtured it. So when I was doing well, if I did something wrong, they corrected me or they rewarded me for the good. And so I think that 
the drive that I had in myself was, was to be the best at whatever I was doing. Understanding, however, that you're not going to come in first all the time. You're not going to be the smartest person all the time. But when you look yourself in the mirror and you can say, job well done, I learned that very early on. That no matter what anyone else says, if you can say, job well done, that's the most important thing. So the drive is something I was born with, but it was nurtured uh, by my, my parents, by my friends, by my teachers, by my coaches, and uh, also by me seeing my picture in the Star Ledger. That didn't hurt matters any. The days varied as I went through life. At one time, I was a student in college at the University of Tennessee, University of Tennessee and I was trying to be a student and also run. I did not make the Olympic team at that time, but the training was really rigorous. So I was a student, uh, morning runs, class, three o'clock practice, weights, uh, dinner, and studying. When 1988 came around, I was out of college, and so the schedule was working. I was working. I worked as a special investigator in the drug diversion section. So I wasn't making enough money at that time. The, um, the wall had not fallen down. So there was East and Black countries were there, and women didn't get contracts like the men got. So, and nor was I running fast enough. So I would go to work. I would run before work. I would uh, go to work, come back, do my second workout on the track or distance runs, lift weights, and then that would be my day. It wasn't until the wall came down in '89 that I was able to um, not work, uh, be one of the best in the world, and then just do a regular schedule, which was the sport was my business. So I would get up in the morning, do my workout, lift weights, swim, uh, go back, relax, and then go again for my second workout uh, that day. And then uh, if I was lucky, lucky, I would have a massage later on. But uh, in life and in business, you have to stay focused. And the focus that I got from sports transcended into business. But to be a champion in anything, uh, it doesn't come easy. And you have to believe in yourself. So regardless of what my friends were doing or where they were going, and I knew that I couldn't do those things. They were distractions. So I stayed the course and stayed focused because I knew what my goal was. And I knew that I wanted to be a champion, an Olympic champion, a world champion. I wanted to be the best in the world. And in order for me to do that, I had to put the time in. And I didn't go to my high school prom when I was younger because I wanted to be the first athlete in New Jersey to win the sectionals, groups, and all groups four consecutive years. So I, and the prom was the day before the all group, so I didn't go to that. Um, when I was the open athlete, we would go away on vacations, and I would ruin the vacation for my friend because I would always want to run in the morning. I'd have to go to bed early that night so I could run the next morning or had to train. But I was focused, and I, I knew what I wanted to do. And so I surrounded myself with people who believed in me and understood my goals and the hard work that it would take and the sacrifices that I had to do to accomplish being, being the best. Well, my inspiration in track and field came from my father because he wanted us to run distance. He ran at William Pass in college when he was uh, growing up and he ran cross country. And he also believed, however, that just because you're black doesn't mean you have to uh, run sprints. So he believed that whatever you tell your kids to do, if you get behind them and direct them, they can be successful at it. So we did track and field, and we ran cross country. And there weren't many black Americans running distance runs. It was basically Africans. And so we ran it, and we ran it well, and I won. And they would always ask, you know, are you from Africa? So I would give them, yeah, but I was born in the States. So my inspiration came from my father saying that you're going to run distance. It teaches you uh, focus, uh, discipline. Uh, you're out there running those long distance runs and you have to deal with being alone and overcoming those obstacles as well. So that's where I got my inspiration for, for distance running was from my father. Um, sports, uh, he believed there was a balance with sports and so we did everything. Academics, my parents believed in that too. Um, if I look at my life now and I, and I look about at what I did uh, in the 800 meters, um, I was happy to have been introduced to distance running and middle distance running, and uh, it taught me a lot. Um, and I met people that I never wouldn't have met being in the distance runs and learning different cultures and learning about different people and getting friends in a time period, to be quite honest, was really difficult because I would be the only black girl, only black 
kid usually at a cross country run because the distance runs were usually by white people. So I had to deal with that and then I would win. So they would look at me like, who is this person? Where is she from? And dealing with the comments that were made. But my parents, you know, would say, look, people are talking about you because you're good. And don't let that distract you from what you want to do. There are going to be good people in all walks of life and bad people in all walks of life. You make sure you're walking with those people that are doing things that you're doing. So as I continued through my, my distance running career, I met wonderful people. But it wouldn't have happened if he didn't put me in the distance runs. And my inspiration was my, was my father. But I think that when I got out there, I was inspired by winning and by winning by large margins and then seeing my name in the paper and getting these medals and these trophies. And it was pretty cool uh, to, to see. And it happened in high school, it happened in college, and it also happened as an open athlete. I would like to say that I never doubted myself. And I always tell kids, you know, you can doubt whoever you want, but never doubt yourself. And I did have self-doubt, but I never doubted that I could do it. I just doubted that I could do it at that time. The doubt was, why didn't it happen? Not doubting that it would ever happen. Things happen in time. I made four Olympic teams. I tried out six times. So I didn't make it in 1980, nor in 1984. 1980, I was in high school. So I got invited to go to the Olympic trials because I ran fast enough and I made the finals. I took seventh then. When I was in college at UT, the University of Tennessee, I did not make the trials finals at all that year. But in 88, my third time trying out, the third time was the, the, the charm, and I made the team by the skin of my shoulder. So I leaned across the line and I out-leaned that fourth person. So I doubted myself uh, at times, but I never doubted that I would make the Olympic team. It was just when I was going to do that. So again, I tell kids, I tell adults, you can doubt anyone, but never doubt yourself. Believe in your dreams. Believe in the hard work that you're putting in to accomplish your dreams. As an athlete, I trained really hard, made a lot of sacrifices, but that's what it took to be the best, to be a champion. Things were not going to happen easily, and not everyone's going to believe in you or be on your side and help you through it. But if you believe in yourself and get people around you in your circle, that's helpful. But again, you may look at me and say, Joe, what are these kids or kids may not have a team of people as you did? Well, sometimes you don't need a team. You just need one person, and that one person is yourself. And you work hard, you train hard, you have these sacrifices, and then what? You may not accomplish your goal, but you don't give up. You keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying. That's what I did. I continue to try, I continue to change things so that I could get a different result. And I continue to put people on my team that believed in me and that would see that I would get as close to my dream as possible. The, when I say as close to, they got me as close to. I was the one that had to get me to the dream. People in your circle help you, but it's you that really gets yourself to that accomplishment or to that vision, uh, to that victory that you had with that vision. Well, my self-love came from the fact that I believed in God and I, and I believe that, you know, there's a higher power and you ought to take care of yourself to believe in yourself, to love yourself. And then I got love from my parents from, and they embraced me. And the love that they gave to me was a love that I appreciate and respect and I wanted to give back to them. And I would give them this love back by accomplishing and doing well. Doing well in school, doing well in sports, being a good daughter, listening following through all the things that I learned, all the morals and values and the foundation I got at home, uh, that taught me about love. And the more I love myself, the more I could love others. And through the work that I do with kids now, I know the importance of loving. And just, you know, when I go to schools and they say, the greatest part of my day, Miss Joetta, was seeing you, that's special. And I give them love. I, I let them know that they can do these things despite of. Uh, it doesn't matter if you come from an urban or a rural or suburban area. It doesn't matter. Kids need love. And I need to love. Being growing up in the city of Newark, then going to South Orange, and then going to Knoxville, Tennessee, and then 
being brought up now, you need love. But if you doubt who you are, and if you don't see the self-value that you have in being a child of God, then if you don't have that, it's going to be hard for you to have the self-love, to have the self-worth, that you are worth something. Track and field doesn't define who I am. I'm defined by what I do, what I give back, by my character, by my integrity, by my morals. That is how I define myself. Track and field is great, Olympic teams, Hall of Fame, those are all great. But when it's all said and done, if I can't look at myself in the mirror and say, job well done, if I can fool everyone that a path for of life and get passed on the back as I pass, but, but, but my true reward will be heartache and pain if I trick the person in the glass. So I don't trick the person in the glass because I believe in myself and I love myself. And so in loving myself, I want to share this love with, with other people. Balance to me and self actualization for me would be basically uh, look at yourself, see what it is that you want to do, look at your skill sets, and then put together a goal, a sheet that's going to help you do that. And to aspire to be great, you can't be great hanging around with the chickens. You want to aspire to fly with the eagles. And so when you look at the chickens and you look at turtles, they have their heads down. And they are blaming, you know, the turtles and chickens will blame people or for having a short neck or looking down or looking no higher than above the grass. But when you soar with the eagles, you spread your wings, you fly high, you aspire to great things. So I tell people, and I believe that no matter what you're going through, the actualization of you flying high, looking up, soaring up in the, in the sky and being with the eagles, that's what it's all about. Because that separates you from everybody else. And it's the separation that makes you great. Everyone's good. Everyone is down here with the turtles and the, eagle, and, and, and the chicken. But not many eagles are out here. So it's the separation that makes you the champion. And in between the turtles and chickens and the eagles and other animals there. But to be great, you have to have the separation to, to fly to higher heights. And that's what self actualization means to me. Being able to separate myself from everybody else and be that eagle, be, that, be the top, be the top person, uh, be it in sports, be it in, in business. What gives me peace and happiness with being able to see the smiles on people's faces, to see the changes that I'm making in kids, to see my daughter growing up and being healthy mentally and physically. Um, the peace I get would be from seeing people that I am around, helping them, and that gives me peace. Um, if I'm not helping, if I'm not making people better, then I'm not resting. Um, it's not about just me doing great things. You have to reach back and bring people along with you. So when I have an intern that I'm helping, uh, that's really great to see them get a job after interning with me. When I'm in a school and a kid comes back and says to me five years you know, uh, in, you know, later, I remember you talked about this and I use that. Those are things that give me peace. Uh, if I'm just going along, making money and, and doing well, and not helping anyone, I'm, I'm not going to rest well. And as for balance, uh, balance is important, but I think so often we try and, and balance the scale. Sometimes it's going to be up, sometimes it's going to be down. But wherever it is, you have to have a peace to know that you're going to get it back here eventually. So when, when I had a full plate, school, training, uh, traveling, uh, being away from home, and not knowing how I was going to meander through that course. And then you have the other end where you want to be home, you want to just relax. There has to be a balance. But at this point in time, it's all about school, graduating, going to NCs, not being in New Jersey. There's going to be a time when I come back to New Jersey, which I did. And then when that happens, then you deal with those things, having the business you know, uh, being successful uh, in, the com in the business community, uh, starting my own business in school districts and making sure kids are healthy and fit and know about nutrition. There's a balance. So is the scale going to always be even? No. But wherever it is, you have to be able to work through it and make sure that you are maximizing 
that part or wherever you are. And not saying, well, it's down, you know, it's not going to go back up. But when it's down, be able to work in the down phase. When it's up, be able to work in the work in the up phase. And when it's in the middle, enjoy that too. So I think that that champions and successful people are able to deal with all levels. If it's high, if it's low, if it's, if it's in the middle, deal with all of the le levels uh, and keeping focused on their visions. Wow, my highest sense of self is to know that I had the capacity to stay focused. And in doing that, it gave me um, a, um, satisfaction that I was able to stay focused, stay the course, and, and, and accomplish things. I, I, I look at you know, my life and it's in stages. I look at what I did when I was five, six, seven, eight, and then in high school, and then in college, and then post-college, and then uh, as a, a wife, and then as a mother, as a you know, daughter, as a sibling. The one common core there was that I care. And because I care, I think that uh, my worth is good. I care. I care about those who I come in contact with. I care about those who believe in me. I care. And I think if I had to use a couple of words, it would be two in this case, is that I care. We all should dream, but I also want to put the work in to make sure my dreams come to fruition. So at this point, I dream to live a, a long, healthy, and happy life. I dream that I see my daughter get out of high school and get out of college and, and go on and make some changes in this world. I dream that the kids that I'm touching uh, now uh, go out and solve some, do something great to make a change. I dream that I continue to, to have the power and the courage to, to challenge myself to come around with in inspiring and, uh, and, uh, and programs that make a difference. You know? So my dreams now are different than they were when I was little. But the one thing that I think that I did when I was little and that I do now is that I dream. And I don't let people tell me my dream. My dreams are unique to myself. And the work and the effort that I have to put into achieving those dreams ultimately come from me. Um, I, I no longer have to rely on my parents' uh, visions of my dreams because I am now a parent. But the foundation and what they taught me about dreams, I still use. I think that if I had one piece of advice to give to my daughter, I would always say, uh, believe in the ace. Be accountable, have character, and get an education. And I think those three words sum up everything. If you are accountable, that means you're not blaming anyone and you're putting the hard work in. If you have character, you're going to have your morals and your values and you're going to stick to them. You're going to go to church. You're going to believe in a higher power, believe in God. And if you have the education, you're able to do everything. Education is a new currency. So if you're educated and if you're able to work uh, in the world around you and bring something that's uh, going to make a difference in the world with your education, then I think you'll be a good person. The Jordan Clark days of today will say to my younger self that whatever you're going through right now is going to be okay. And you're going to come out on top. So go through the challenges of, of, of race. Go through the challenges of your parents uh, being divorced. Go th through the challenges of deciding what school you're going to go to. Go through the challenges of being um, uh, a champion and then maybe not getting the money that you should, thought you should have gotten. Go through all of that because when it's all said and done, it's going to be okay. And I realize that now, in 2015, that everything I went through, every step I went through was for a reason. And I would tell her that the uh, curve in the, the curve or the end of the road, don't believe that. Keep bending. The bend in the road is not the end of the road. It's only the end if you forget the turn. So no matter what you're going through, keep on turning. 
because if you don't, that will be the end of your road. And so uh, I look at my life now, I kept turning. I didn't let what people were saying about me, what I said about myself, where I was at that point, be the end of my road. I kept turning, I kept trying to figure it out and come out with some new ideas to help me get to the end of my road. And I'm not there yet. I'm still turning. There are a lot of things that I want to accomplish in, in the field of um, uh, fitness and health and wellness with, with kids and trying to, to encourage them to, to be healthy. I'm trying to encourage them to, to graduate out of high school and find either a college or a skilled uh, a trade, uh, a community college to attend. I'm trying to do all this, so I'm still evolving as I go through the other part of my life. But what I learned uh, younger and the core values that I learned have left an indelible imprint in my mind and in my heart. So I know that I succeeded then, I had challenges, challenges then, I'm going to succeed now, I'm going to have challenges now. And I'm not going to blame anyone for anything, I'm going to prepare myself and be ready for the challenge by continuing to turn uh, through the bends and not going off the road. I look at my entire life, everything. I tell people I had a blessed life. I've, I've traveled the world. I went to college for free. I've graduated. I met great people. I've been self-employed for over 25 years. Um, I married. I have a child. I'm healthy. My parents are still here. My siblings are still here. My friends are here. So I don't have any regrets. I would like to say that I regret not. I don't regret not, because I always got back in there and tried. So I can't say that I regret not trying. I never, I never gave up. I continued to see it through, and I would change things to, to make my visions come to fruition. So I don't have any regrets. I had a wonderful childhood. I have a, a wonderful adult life. And if I had to do it all again, things happen for a reason. I would have chosen my parents, chosen my siblings, chosen growing up in the city of Newark and going to South Orange and Columbia High School because it made me who I am. Jersey Pride to me, it just means being able to overcome obstacles. It means being able to to hold your head up high and talk about which, where you come from and the people you met. Uh, you know, Jersey Pride, it being in Newark, the museums, going down to the shore, going to the amusement parks, going to the culture, the agriculture, you know, it just, Jersey pride is just, when you, when you, when you say I'm from Jersey, you hear that, I'm from Jersey, it's just like, yeah, I am too. So that resonates with me. So Jersey pride is being able to identify with, with people and being able to say that I'm from that great state. It may be small, but it, it packs a powerful punch. And then you look at all the people that have come from the state, the, the governors, the presidents, the actresses and actors and educators and scientists and athletes, you know, it's just a, a great, a great place. And I, you know, I put this state up against anyone as far as what we've accomplished as individuals, uh, where, we, where we're going uh, as, a, as a state. And I think that, you know, you can go wherever you want to go, but Jersey will be up in the top in all the categories. And that's the pride, knowing that you come from a state that is diverse, but yet, you are, we're resilient as people, and we overcome storms, we weather things together, and that's when you know that I'm proud to be from New Jersey, is when we're weathering all of this together, no matter what the this is. In 1960, 1962, when I was born, the this was different than what it is for someone being born in 2015, but we accomplished it and worked through it together, and that's a, a, a pride moment for me. Staying in the moment and to enjoy the ride, how do I do that? I didn't always do that because as an athlete, you're always trying to do something, go to the next thing. You're always trying to be the world champion. You're always trying to run faster. You're always trying to make the next Olympic team or break the next record. It wasn't until uh, 2000 when I retired and I got all of my bib numbers from 1988, four years later, 92, four years later, 96, four years later, 2000. That meant that I was the top in the world for over 25 years. 
And it wasn't until I saw that that I said, I missed so much of it because I was always trying to do this or do more. So from 2000 and on, I decided that I was going to enjoy the moment, to, to enjoy the ride, to enjoy the preparation. And then when I got to where it was I wanted to go, or accomplish the goal in business or whatever it was, that would be good too, but to, to enjoy the ride. Don't be so quick to put on another bib number for another competition. Don't be so quick to not uh, stay true to your, to your mission for your business. Enjoy the moment, enjoy the ride. And that didn't really happen until 2000 because I was always trying to run faster, you know, go to that, get more money, get another contract, do that. And I had to have a you go girl moment. Look at what I've done, you go girl, I've done a lot. I've accomplished a lot, but it wasn't that it was never enough. I never looked at it as being enough because I was always off to the next thing. And I think that if I can give anyone any information or words of wisdom, enjoy the moment. It's because that moment is going to propel you to your next victory. And we are so busy going through the moments, we don't get realize our victories because we're not appreciating what we've done. People often say, if you have no passion, you're not going to be successful. You have to have passion. You have to believe in something. I, I believe that you have to be passionate about something. And however, just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you're going to be successful at it. So although I might be passionate about dance, and I was, I wasn't going to be able to make a living at that. So with your passion, you have to find your design that you're your reason for being. And once you find that, then your passion can become um, your purpose. And for me, my passion was track and field. My passion was, was the traveling. So track and field was a way for me to, to travel and not have to pay for it. <laughs> it was a way for me to start a business and to help people. So um, my passion, I was able to turn it into a business. And I'm passionate about uh, being the best that I could be. And because I have that passion, I have to figure out what is needed for that to, to accomplish. And I think that throughout my life, I've been able to do that. Um, I'm passionate about you know, family. I'm passionate about friends. I'm passionate about health, wellness. And I try and do as many things as possible for, for me to accomplish uh, the end result in each category. Fun and passion, they work together. Uh, the, the hard work and, and everything I did, it, it is fun. You know, it was my fun. Everyone has their own uh, uh, unique uh, point of fun. And fun sometimes is ha ha he he. But fun sometimes is just you sitting there looking at the waves at the shore coming, looking at the sunset. So it doesn't always have to be ha ha and he he. And I think fun ultimately for me sometimes is to look back at my track record um, in business and in sports and say, hey, you did fun that bad. You know, you were pretty good. And I, I, I get fun now uh, and enjoyment out, out of looking at what, what I've done and, and, and looking at uh, who, who I have affected uh, and, and where I can go now. I want to be remembered as somebody that cared uh, as a person. As an athlete, I want to be remembered as someone that was prepared, that was tenacious, and whenever you saw her on the track, you know you had to bring your A game because she was going to have hers. Um, in business, I want to be remembered as someone that was resilient, that someone that believed so much in the kids that she's trying to help to stay uh, healthy and teach life skills to that she was willing to go after sponsorships and, and put herself out there, put her own money out there to make sure that these kids weren't being left behind. That didn't matter if they were from rural, urban, or suburban. Kids are kids. And I wanted to make sure that they were, 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 were taken care of. Uh, as a wife, I want to be remembered as someone that was dedicated to the family. As uh, a mother, someone that uh, worked really hard to try and raise uh, my daughter up in a way that's sound and, and spiritually based. As a daughter, 
someone that listened uh, and, and understood uh, what my parents were trying to teach me and is using that now in her family life as a sibling, someone that was rough and tough but cared and no one could mess with my siblings and protected, and as a friend, someone that would give you the shirt off their back, uh, and that means to help you no matter what. And I think that it's hard to say just the one thing because it means different things to, to different people, but I guess if I had to use the one word, I would stick to the word of caring. The Joetta Clark Dick Sports Foundation started in 2002, and our mission is to teach wellness, fitness, nutrition, and life skills in students K through 12. And we go in and we're the gym program, we talk about uh, health and wellness and the importance of eating healthy and, and obesity and, and diabetes and it's changed over the years but the one thing that has not changed is that we believe that we have to be in the school systems in order to touch these kids. I think the one thing that I would like to leave everyone with in kids and, and adults you know alike is that you have to aspire to, to great things and just because you're at a low point in your life doesn't mean you're supposed to stay there. So I talked about the eagles. You look up because if you look up you can fly up and you can achieve great things and put yourself and surround yourself with people that are going where you're going and if they're, and if they're not doing what you know would be right then you can't hang out with them. And, and that's what I did as an athlete and that's what I do in life as a person aspire to achieve great things. And in my book, I talk about the five P's. You have to have a purpose, you get prepared, you're patient, you get perturbed, and you persevere. And if you do those things, you will be successful in everything that you do. And you have to do them in that order. You can't persevere without having a purpose. So that's basically how I kind of sum things up. When I'm on the line, I'm thinking about staying relaxed and, and the thought process is in the warm-up. When you get to the start line, you have to think about being ready to deal with what's going to happen, running your strategy. And sometimes you, you can't execute, so you have to be able to, to change and, 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 and figure out as you're running what's really going on in that race. So when I'm running, I'm on automatic pilot. But if I see danger, danger, you know, I, gotta, I have to adjust. But when I'm on automatic pilot, pilot, I'm in the front, I'm running my splits, and everything is going great. But sometimes you're going to get boxed in, you're going to get cut off, you're not going to get a good start, and then you have to engage. And engaging means to get out of that box, to, to time yourself properly so you can meander through the packs of people. And so when it's all said and done, you come across the line victoriously. What I think about doing my warm-up process is, you know, who is in the race, my strategy, uh, don't get boxed in, get a good start, try and be at this point at that time, uh, stay relaxed, Just talking about positive things. I've trained really hard, I had these sacrifices, it's showtime, I wanted to be here. I'm talking myself into the competition, not out of it.